Welcome to the online teaching ministry of Pastor Rob Ginter and Farmdale Baptist Church. For more content, visit us online at farmdalebaptist.com. They hooked us and then they confused us. To be specific, Samantha and I used to watch TV before kids. And uh, one of the shows on Netflix was called Crossing Lines. And um, it's kind of older, so I'm, if I spoil it, you've had the opportunity to watch this show and you haven't. So don't blame me. But in Crossing Lines, uh, it's an international crime fighting team that goes from European country to European country and uh, they fight crime on behalf of the international court. Sounds very interesting. It was, it was very interesting. With compelling main characters, and we watched an entire season of it, and then we got to season two, and everyone had either died off or been replaced by contract disputes. I Googled it. <laughs> so what happened in Crossing Lines is we lost interest and we quit watching because we weren't sure what it was about or where it was going because the people kept changing. So what was it about really and where was it going? The book of Acts can feel similar for us. When we ask the question, what has this book been about? What, what's, it, what's this all about? And it's more consequences than whether or not one loses interest in a Netflix show. If we don't understand what this book is about, then we're going to have a hard time figuring out what we are to be about. What's Acts about? What are we to be about? Well, we started in, in, verse, in chapter 1 with Luke writing to Theophilus about his gospel being what Jesus began to do and teach, which implied for us that what was before us would be about what Jesus would continue to do. And the issue with that is that Jesus shows up in Acts 1 and he makes a cameo appearance and then leaves. And many, many moons ago, we learned that since Jesus' mission continues, our mission continues. That's, what, that's how we started this, by understanding that. Since Jesus' mission continues, our mission continues. And we are focused, empowered, and sent by Jesus to be on a mission. That's what we learned at the very beginning. But at the very end, we see what Jesus' mission is really about for us. And the point here at the end is that the mission is about a message for the multitudes. The mission is about a message. So after he makes his cameo in verses 6 through 8 in chapter 1, he leaves his disciples saying, and they ask him, when, when is this kingdom going to be restored to Israel? And he responds, that's not really your department. But instead, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the other most parts of the earth. There's the outline for how the book progressed from there. They received the Holy Spirit and then the focus begins on Peter. And then Peter fades, and they create deacons, and they fade. And then there is Stephen, who's stoned to death by the hand uh, under the management of Saul, who then becomes the main character, kind of, for a moment from th that time forward. But then what we look at today in Acts chapter 28 is this guy who's the main character is in house arrest and the book ends. And before you complain at Luke and being like, that's really lame. That's how it sputters out is like he's, he's in jail and he goes on. In that, we understand that Paul, right, is not the main character of the book of Acts. Neither is Peter or Stephen or any other person, or you, you can't really even say that there's a, a highlighted person of the Trinity that is the main, well, I mean, technically you could say the Trinity is the main character of the Bible, of the world, and of everything, but like there's not a focus here throughout. 
Maybe you say it's the works of the Holy Spirit. You could. But I would venture to say that the main character of the book of Acts is not really a person, but news. News. It's a message about a person. And that message makes it to Rome. Now, through imprisonments, court trials, death plots, shipwrecks, snake bites, the Apostle Paul makes it to Rome. And we are clarified in this last section that the main star is God's message of the gospel. And how do we figure that out here at the end, what the book has been about the entire time? As the man goes on, as the man goes on, uh, in the ground, for the most part, right? And the message goes on. And the message goes on. And this is how the book ends in verse 23. It says, Paul gets this crowd and he expounds to them what constitutes really the Old Testament scriptures. So we don't get resolution for Peter. We don't get resolution for Paul. So what comes to the forefront is a message that is not created by a person. A message that is, does, it has, it is independent of people. And it doesn't have to be recognized by the church to be authoritative. Instead... What does he do here? He expounds the scriptures. He opens them up. So it's not a message that is created. It's a message that is unveiled. It's unveiled here. He opened up the Old Testament scriptures. We understand, right, that the message is what creates the mission. The message creates the mission. And the mission, mission is opening up that message that created the mission. So you have the message of the Lord Jesus that creates the mission. And on that mission, we open up the message to people. So he opened up the law and the prophets. He exposed them, to, Luke, to use Luke's word in the original, he exposed them to to the scriptures. He didn't impose an agenda on the scriptures. He exposed the scriptures to the people. God's agenda and plan. Similarly, that is what that's what we do. If we desire to be on Jesus's mission, you're not in the marketing department charged to be creative. Right? You're not you're not creating anything. You're not trying to be clever. What are you doing? You're exposing people to the agenda of God in the scriptures. That's it. What is the agenda? What's the agenda? It is a kingdom. And from it we learn we are to be on a mission with a message for the kingdom. That's in the rest of verse 23. From morning until evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets. So he opened up the scriptures and testified or witnessed about the kingdom of God. You remember this, that question, right? From Acts 1, will you now restore the kingdom? He responds, It's not your business to know how this is going to work. It is your job to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And we are to witness or to testify that everything finds its source, should submit itself to a kingdom. Under a sphere of God's reign. That is the kingdom of God. The sphere of God's reign. And you might say, doesn't God reign everywhere? Isn't he sovereign over every square inch of the universe? In every universe? Why, certainly. Why, certainly. But that's not necessarily the way that Paul is using this. And it's not really how it's used elsewhere. Example, John the Baptist come. He he came and said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. 
And Jesus said, likewise. So if the kingdom of God consists of all the universe over which God reigns, why would anybody announce that it was near or that it was here? Well, at the heart of this is the idea of God's messianic kingdom. God's king has come. Amen. God's king has come. Who will not just redeem his people, but take the rightful place as king. This invades the storyline of human history and invites everyone, commands everyone to submit. We love the idea of meta narrative. Big story, big picture. We love it. Marvel is creating a universe, if you will, in which that all of these little bitty stories fit into the universe or the metaverse or the, the Marvel universe. And they all come together in things like the Avenger movies. And you realize most people, and like Facebook, right? Is, they changed its name, technically, the company. It's not Facebook. You know what it is? It's meta. It's meta, right? Because they desire to set, to be the reality in which that everything else finds its connection therein. So you can't tell me that there, there are not people here and everywhere that is trying to do this. It's trying to find how that their life connects into a larger picture. That they're, they're grabbing for something bigger in which that everything fits within. The problem is, anytime we're grasping for an ultimate reality, a bigger picture, a bigger story that everything fits in, if it is not related to the kingdom of God, it is a fictitious reality. It's a fictitious reality. Meta is not meta. It's many. Meta is not meta. It's many. We know that Marvel is, is, is a fake world and, and they, don't, they don't exist. Facebook is a fictitious meta narrative that they're trying to form as well. And everything else. So we have people trying to see how their little story makes sense in the flow of history. How do I fit into this world? This answers one of the three big questions. Where did I come from? Who am I? And where am I going? The three questions that many of us try to figure out, trying to make our lives make sense, grasping into something bigger, something that matters, you see the struggle, right? People, if, if you go up to a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher and you say, why are you doing what you're doing? The teacher might say, well, I'm trying to invest in the lives of, of others to where I'm trying to reach the next generation, trying to make an impact on them. That's, that's very noble. That's good. You go to the doctor and you go, why are you doing what you're doing? And they say, well, I'm trying to... To, to heal so that, that people continue on with their life so their lives are prolonged. And it goes on. You say, that's, that's very noble. It's very noble of you. Now the issue is that you can give all of your energy so that, that people's lives are prolonged, children are educated, greenhouse gas emissions are eliminated. You can, you can give all of your efforts to all of these things. And yet... Waste your life in the pursuit of these things. In the pursuit of a human utopia. When in reality, when you open up the scriptures, you find out that everything we are living for and aiming at is to be within one story of the kingdom of God. So yes, try, yes, I don't want to discourage you. Be like, I was going to be a doctor until I heard that guy. Now I'm going to go begging. No, no, that's not it. That's not it, right? You can make this world a, a better place. You can. So long as it is humbled beneath and connection to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. 
We can't ignore the reality that God has created us to live, thrive, move, and walk within his kingdom. And to go beyond that lends ourselves to artificial meaning. That's what Paul's talking about here. His purpose for being in Rome is the message, and the message is about a kingdom, and the kingdom has a king. If you look at the next phrase in verse 23, he's trying to persuade them concerning Jesus. So what does this message about the kingdom do? It is to persuade, to convince. A message of the kingdom, persuading them about the king. From the scriptures. That's what he's doing. Everything finds its meaning within the kingdom. Everything is held together within the son who is the king. Paul would write this to the church at Colossae. He would say, and he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. So this isn't a vague kingdom that we get to add our definition to. No, this is a very specific kingdom with a very specific king who before, is before all things, and in him all things hold together, that everything in him, that he might be preeminent. So this is a check from this passage. Are we, when I ask you, are you on the mission of Jesus? One, is there the message involved in the mission? The mission. Are we sharing about how all things find their meaning in relation to the kingdom of God? It points to the preeminent Son of God, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. It would be really hard to tell others to submit their lives to, the king, to this kingdom if we're not convinced ourselves. You see that in verse 23, that his goal here is to convince them about Jesus. Let me tell you who's not going to convince anybody anything about Jesus. Someone who is sitting here today who is not themselves convinced. And what would that being unconvinced look like? Well, it would look like you were assigning your life, the meaning, the purpose, the direction of your life to an alternative reality. In which you think you go to work for work. You think you go to work for money. You think you go to work for money to be able to retire. You think you go to work for money and who's going to retire? Nobody. We're all going to work till we die. No one will be able to afford to retire. Sorry. Sorry about breaking your hearts. But let me break them even further. You go to work for a kingdom. That is your employer. And how do you know that you're on this mission of the kingdom? How does the message impact you? How do you use the message at work? How do you spread that message at work? Or do you like to pretend that you're on a mission without a message? See, that's a problem, isn't it? How do, you, how do we know that we're pretending to be on this mission? Well, I ask you and I say, do you, do you consider yourself a follower of Jesus? If I asked you a question like that, then you'd be like, oh yeah, absolutely I do. What makes you think that? Well, I, uh, I have been forgiven of my, my, my sins and I'm, I'm justified, like they talked about in Sunday school today, right? He's, he has justified me by faith, through, uh, uh, through, through grace, by grace through faith. He's done that. Wow, great, yeah. That's, that is the bedrock of these things. But, but you were talking about but like being a follower. What makes you think you're following That's kind of active, isn't it? If you were to say that, right? Like, I'm, I'm following him. Oh, okay, you're following him, that's great. 
So you're on his mission, you'd say. Yeah, I am. You realize that the mission is about a message? It's news? So the convicting thing about what we see here, right, is the, the highlighting here is he opens the scriptures. He tells them about a kingdom and the king there from the scriptures, Moses and the prophets. You can't have the mission without the message. So we can't pretend that we're on the mission and we leave the message at home. Why, there's a really good chance that we're not on the mission without the message. This entire time is not about Paul getting to Rome but an emphasis on the gospel message getting to Rome via Paul. We see that here, by the way, he opens up the scriptures and he tells them about the kingdom and the king therein. Verse 23, he expounds, exposes them to the truth, and he connects it to a kingdom about a king. That's what Paul preached. And verse 24 says that some were convinced and others disbelieved. And the ones that didn't believe left after Paul said this in verse 25. And disagreeing amongst themselves, they departed after Paul made one statement. So what was the one thing that was like that emptied the place out? What emptied this place? How was the sermon? Well, everybody walked out when he said this. That's what it is. Look at your Bible. Verse 25, the Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's hearts has grown dull and their ears can barely hear and their eyes they've closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. So we're to be on a mission with a message for the kingdom that is forever spreading. Forever spreading. And we'll see this as he goes from this audience to the Gentiles here in just a second. But first, we see the first house he goes to. And it didn't go so hot. The rejection of the Jews here in the passage. He's quoting Isaiah chapter 6. And Pastor Jonathan has mentioned it, but before he said that, you might not even have, meant, have, have recognized that this was Isaiah chapter 6. You might not even recognized it. Why? Because at mission conferences and youth groups and places across the land, people open up Isaiah chapter 6, and we see that the year the King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, Isaiah says, upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And there's these sinless beings who are covering their face and flying, and they're crying out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Amen. At this, the prophet repents. He says, I am ruined. Woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips, and I'm amongst the people who are on the same trip. Paraphrase. And then the Lord asks a question. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Right? We're thinking of the missions conference. We're thinking of the youth group. Right? Like, you're in your, who's going to go to school with the gospel? Like, who, who's, going to look, who's going to be the person who said, the Lord's saying to you, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then, you know, we're sitting back there and we're like, here am I, send me. Here my sin me. But that's the beginning of the chapter. That's the beginning of the chapter. And we all get fired up about that. Until we read the end of the chapter. And it's in the end of the chapter. He says, you're, you're going to speak till the air is close. You're going to speak till they plug their ears. You're going to try to show them they're blind. You're going to do all this and nobody is going to listen. Nobody's going to listen to you. Nobody's going to do it. 
they're going to see, not know what they're looking at. They're going to hear, not understand. In the context of Isaiah 6, it really ends there. You're going to preach to Israel, right, in context, until the city is devastated and it lies in waste. And it was a tree, healthy, but it's going to be a stump. I thought you said this is like a message that's forever spreading and, and this seems kind of like the end. Well, in Isaiah chapter 6, it really is the end. But there's just a little bit of hope in the passage. And it's at the very end. It says the holy seed is a stump. Meaning it's still there. It's still there. It's devastated, devastation. The base of the trees on the ground. But the stump is still there. Is it going to do anything? Is it going to, is it going to, is it, is there any hope? Is there any hope for anything? There's, there's this message that went out and it's devastated all of these people and no one, no one listened and they all turned away. That's interesting that, <laughs> that, Paul uses this at the end of Luke. So we're like on Jesus' mission with a message. And he goes, okay, I'm going to go to the Jews. And they didn't listen. And their ears were closed. That's what they did. So he preached till they're hard -hearted. they were hard-hearted to the truth. Their lives were devastated. But the good news for us is that it didn't stop there. And we see something here in Acts chapter 28 that Isaiah never saw, really. Right? He's looking at a tree stump, one, probably wondering, the holy seed's now a stump. That's bad news. But the good news is, is that the gospel didn't stop to hard-hearted Israel. The gospel didn't die with ethnic Jews. Because of, look at verse 28. It says, therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. They will listen. So God offered the message of salvation to the Jews via Paul, and they heard till their ears closed, but the message kept going, my friends. The message kept going. The message of salvation was sent past Israel to the Gentiles. You know, I said we don't really understand what happens to the main character, but we really do. The main character ends and lands in the book right where he's supposed to by the sovereignty of God. The message goes to the multitudes. The message is not, the, the, the book of Acts is not about Peter, Paul, Mary, or anybody else. The book of Acts is about the spread of God's message of salvation. That's it. Now, church history tells us what happens to Peter. Early church history, Peter was forced to watch the crucifixion of his own wife before he was crucified upside down because he didn't believe he was worthy to die the same way his Lord did as remains buried outside of Rome. Or Paul was beheaded by the emperor Nero. It was his remains buried outside of Rome. Now that barrier side's now a church. Figure that out. I say all this because we want the closure about the people. Luke wrote to show us that it's not about the people, but the spread of the gospel. Peter and Paul are both dead, and the gospel still spreads today. You believe that that message of salvation is still here today. That's why Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. How do we know he wasn't talking about Peter? He's dead. That's one of the ways. Peter confesses that thou art the Christ, in your King James, right? And, and he said, the gates of hell is not going to prevail against the church. I will build my church on this rock. The rock was not Peter. 
because Peter's dead. And the church remains. She remains rooted in, on the rock of Christ and the message of the salvation of God to the nations. She remains today because of what we see here in the book of Acts. The gospel passed, as one commentator put it, through the uncaring and ascent to the unthinkable. The Gentiles who didn't know anything about God, God sends the gospel of his son to the entire world, regardless of what they know, their previous knowledge or their background or category or some type of identification that they have. God sends the gospel to those people. If you really think about it, what's happening here in Acts chapter 28, the gospel has its blinker on and it's coming to your house. To your house it does. Because you're probably not likely to be a part of ethnic Israel. Not likely. The gospel goes not only to Rome, but is sent to the Gentiles. And the reason that we are Christians today is because the gospel is forever spreading. Amen. It is forever spreading. The convicting question for us, right? If, I'm, if I said we're on a mission, the mission of Jesus and it's with a message, and there's a couple aspects of that message, that it is for a kingdom, and it is forever spreading. Is the message of the gospel, if you're a Christian, you have to answer the serious question of, is the gospel message going to die with you without spreading through you? Through you. You know, I still get a couple of unsolicited phone calls a day on my phone. I made a terrible mistake a while back, and I put my number in trying to ask a question about insurance. And they have hunted me down like a deer ever since. And they will not leave me alone. I have insurance. But I have to fight somebody to tell them I have it every day. Sometimes I just ignore them. But you know what this is? It's a modern adaptation of what us old people will know as a chain letter. Has anybody got an old-fashioned chain letter recently? Do you know what that is? The kids are like, letters with a chain on it? I don't get it. No, no, no. See, th what it is is that they would call you and they would... Or they would write you, rather, and you were charged to then write, annoy someone else. At least with the telemarketers, they annoy us and they're not like, hey, you're now forced to be a telemarketer. Wouldn't that be awful? If they're like, ha, huh, I will only get off this call if you promise to annoy someone else. Call a stranger. Right? It could be worse. It could be worse. Could be worse. So what we see with a chain letter is if you stop the spread, you get a curse or bad luck, whatever that is, by breaking the chain. And just to be honest, how bad was your fortune? You got a letter. That was what stunk. How, what could be worse than that? But no, they say, hey, it'll get worse if you don't write it to someone else. You see, that? that's silly. This annoyance has made it to you. Pass it on to someone else. Annoy someone else. Put pressure on you or some kind of superstitious thing is going to happen to you. Something spooky. Silliness. Silly pagan silliness. But let me tell you something, some kind of holy pressure that should be put on you instead of some kind of pagan silliness. Holy pressure is this. The message of the gospel has made it to your heart. You should feel something in there to pass that on to someone else. Amen. It's not a chain letter or a telemarketer. Verse 28, it is the salvation of God sent. That's what it is. Sent to you. And why does that matter? Well, because we 
were born in sin conceived in iniquity. It all happened because God is holy and righteous and just and perfect in all of his ways. He does good and is good. And he always does good. And he created us in his image. Male and female, he created them. And what does is, what is his creation do? Did they obey him? No. The creation rebelled against him, saying we could make our own decisions and run our own lives and do it better than you. We know better than you, our creator. We are going to be autonomous from you and run our own lives. The Bible has a word for that. It's called sin. And it has separated us from God. Did God leave us separated? Well, let me tell you, the message of salvation is that God became a man in the person of the Lord Jesus who lived the perfect life. That means he was right and always did right. Unlike us, who when we do what we want and do what we do, the Bible calls that sin. The Lord Jesus did not sin. As they quoted this morning in Sunday school, he who knew no sin became sin for us. As they even mentioned, he did not become a sinner. But what happened was he lived the perfect life and he died on the cross and all of our rebellion against God was placed on him. Nailed to him. And his death paid the penalty of our sin. Yes, and then on the third day, he rose from the grave victorious over death, hell, the grave, everyone, everything in between. Therefore, God highly exalted him. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the <laughs> to the glory is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. That is the position that He fills, holds, and is. And that is the news of this message that God reigns in Christ. That's the mission we've been comm commissioned to spread. But we can't say we are on the mission without the message. The mission is about a message. I'll say that again. The mission is about a message. The mission is about a message. The mission is about a message. But unfortunately, statistics say that a lot of us are claiming to be on a mission without a message. Let me say that a different way. There are many Christians who have not and do not make it a practice to share the gospel with anybody. With anybody. Ever. I'm not saying, have you led someone to Christ? I'm not going to ask a question like that. Like, so were you there when the baby was born? I'm not saying that. That's not our responsibility. We're messengers, witnesses. You're not saviors. You are witnesses of news that is a message. The problem with the silent lips of us who believe we're on a mission is what Paul says in Romans. He says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. So the, the, the apostle believed that delivering the gospel was an obligation. An obligation, a priority of his life. That you will never do and never participate in if you don't see it as an obligation. See it as an obligation. One problem is that you don't see it as an obligation. To spread the message. 
Until you see it as an obligation, you won't be eager. He realized he was obligated to share the gospel, so he was eager to do it. If you see it as an obligation, that will create that eagerness in you. But why? Because if you see sharing the message about the kingdom of God coming to the person of Christ as your obligation, you won't go to these fake realities of this is what my life is about. This is the purpose. This is why I'm alive. This is where I'm, why I'm going. You won't supplement that. You won't substitute that. But you'll plug it into God's purpose for you. The reality that you are to live within. So if if you don't feel an obligation to share the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ risen from the dead, then why do you think you're alive? Why do you think you're alive? You say, well, I'm alive to worship God. Absolutely. And this, right? There's more than one purpose. But ultimately, I'm saying you're alive to worship God and to tell others what Christ has done for them so that they might worship God. Right? The, as John Piper says, the, the goal of missions is worship. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Now, Paul answers the question in the context of Romans 1, what made him obligated and eager? What made, what made him... Because if it's an obligation, that... Oh, that just bothers me. Like, it's an obligation. All I need is another obligation, isn't it? I need something else on the schedule, don't I? See, maybe a problem is, is that we see sharing the gospel as an obligation. Maybe that is a problem. Because in context of Romans 1, he says he was given grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. Probably didn't get, get apostleship, but you certainly have been given grace. Amen. See how this is a grace-filled obligation? So, for instance, if you were given the job of shoveling dirt onto a trailer, they were, you, you were given a shovel, and, and your job was to fill that trailer do the work. So you're shoveling the dirt onto the trailer. You might be able to look over at your neighbor and say, he is so lazy. He's so lazy. He can't shovel like I shovel. He's not putting his back into it like I'm putting my back into it. He's not doing as good as I'm doing. We are told to dig. I'm digging way better than him. Well, they can't dig as hard and as fast as me. They need to try harder and put their back into it. But if you saw yourself as someone who wasn't given a job, but was given a gift, see, that's different. That's different. If you were given something that you didn't deserve, and you look over at your neighbor, and you realize that you don't deserve it, your neighbor doesn't deserve it, their neighbor doesn't deserve it, None of us deserve what God has given us in Christ and the grace therein. If we look at it like that, right, as a grace-filled obligation, it's not just a job, dig. No, 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 that's not, that's not it. That's not it. It is a grace-filled obligation to preach the gospel. You've been given grace. Isn't it so good that you've been given that gift that you'd never deserve, never could earn? Yeah. Now look at your neighbor. Think about it. They don't deserve it. And you don't deserve it. How good is God that he would give you that gift? How good is he? And you love him, don't you? Now look at your neighbor again. The one is probably at your house, right? Give them that gift. Don't tell them to dig like you dug because you, didn't, you, didn't, you couldn't do it. Right? Jesus has done for you what you could not do for yourself, living the perfect life, dying on the cross and raising from the dead. 
You could never do that. You could never please God like Jesus pleased God. Jesus pleased God in your place. And now you look at your neighbor and realize that the purpose of your life is sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to equally undeserving people as you about the grace that you have received. See, that's different. The question for us to think about is do we love God who gave us the gift or do we love the comfort that comes from our silent lips? Do we love God more than the comfort that we get from silent lips about him? And as we think about that question, right? Because comfort is nice, isn't it? It feels good. So when you look at your lost neighbor and you don't share the gospel with him, you love that comfort of being quiet. You love that comfort of talking about other things that don't make them uncomfortable. The problem with that comfort that we might be tempted to hold on to is that the message of the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, to the world, to the nations. The question is, will it be sent through you? Because the mission that you all and I are to be on is about this message, what God has done in Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your message of Christ in the place of sinners. I pray that you would strengthen us to be faithfully sharing this message to the undeserving, dying world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.